This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. What hope is there for life on this muddled mud ball? Ours is an age of everything commingled. Fear, frustration, hope, anger, bewilderment. One famous author who's written countless books and magazine articles on the problems and potentials of mankind remarked, I don't know where the world is going. I feel like a Paul Revere who doesn't know whether the British are coming. There's a lack of certitude regarding religious matters as well. When the Nielsen survey recently polled 1,600 adults who regularly attend Sunday worship services, 34% of them said they went not because they felt particularly helped by the services themselves, but because they wanted to set a good example for their children. Curious that even people who have little use for religion themselves still think that it's good for the children. And why might that be? Why would it be good for a child to have faith in God, but not particularly good or necessary for an adult to? The reason most adults say they want religion for the children, but not particularly for themselves, is that they quite rightly dread. They fear what a real dose of real religion would do to them and with them. They would not be the same, and they know it. And to someone, any person who cherishes being exactly the way he is and staying exactly the way he is in unchanging, complacent comfort, the thought of being transformed is actually terrifying. Surprisingly, the person most in dread of what real religion could do to him is often not the thief, prostitute, murderer, scoundrel. It's the person whose life is genteel, refined, intelligent, sophisticated. The person who may be charming and cultured in every way, and yet who fears commitment, who shrinks from any loyalty so grandiose that it demands from him all he is and all he or she hopes to be. Culture and education are noble fruitions of evolutionary advancement. They are greatly to be appreciated and highly to be valued, but they can never satisfy the soul. There are cravings far deeper than for social graces. Man yearns for God, and only the finding of God can satiate that yearning. Declared the Master, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? And again he said, man cannot live by bread alone. Jesus taught the infinite value of human beings. You may think you're the sort of person even your mother couldn't love. I don't know. I don't know either you or your mother. But I do know this, that you are someone who is loved by the everlasting God of all this universe. You can share your life with God, literally, That's prayer, and that is worship, talking with God informally. Simply informally is as embarrassing to those who don't know God as praying to God formally is to those who do know him. Your relationship with God can and ought to be free, joyous, and spontaneous. Living in a growing sense of God consciousness, living as it feels right to live in faith. Pray not to God as your ineffable hugeness, but share your life as one personality to another personality. God can know and be known, love and be loved, and in this knowing and loving of God, there's inexpressible joy, there's delight and transformation for the living of your life. On one occasion, Jesus said, it is impossible for a good tree to produce bad fruit, as impossible as it is for a bad tree to produce good fruit. Do not men know what a tree is by its fruit? You cannot pick figs from briars, he says, or gather a bunch of grapes from a blackberry bush. A good man produces good things from the good things stored in his heart, and a bad man produces evil from his own stores of evil, says Jesus. For his words will reveal what is treasured in his heart. One of the next objections a person may encounter to religion, to the teachings of Jesus, to what this man 2,000 years ago was talking about, is that some people will say it simply isn't commensurate with the latest findings of science, with the intellectual life, with what man has learned about the nature of this universe, of life on this planet, physical reality, and our studies of physics, chemistry, biology, biochemistry. 
And yet Dr. Robert A. Millikan, the Nobel Prize winner in physics, described the responsibilities of science and religion in this fashion, and I quote him, the purpose of science is to develop without prejudice or preconception of any kind a knowledge of the facts, the laws, the processes of nature. The even more important task of religion, and that is interesting in itself, that Professor Millikan describes the task of religion as even more important than that of science, whereas he himself is a scientist. He says, the more important task of religion is to develop the conscience, the ideals, and the aspirations of mankind. Here's an eminent scientist maintaining that there is no contradiction, no conflict between true science and true religion. Both are, in fact, quests for truth. In your personal finding of truth, you will discover a liberation. Again, declared Christ, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth, the discovery, the reality that you are a son or daughter of the living God. You are not a cosmic orphan. The very first source and center of all things and beings, the creator, the controller, the infinite upholder of all reality in this universe of universes loves you with an everlasting love, with a love which will not let you go and has given a fragment of infinity of his very living, pulsating, kinetic spirit to indwell your mind, to electrify your personality, to make you new by the processes of internal transformation that God has a plan for this planet and a purpose, a will, for your individual life. And if you seek it, you can and will find it. And only transformed men and women can create a transformed world. In a recent book, The Transformation, A Guide to the Inevitable Changes in Humankind, by George Leonard, former editor of Look Magazine, he wrote, and I quote, Recognizing that we are in the process of transforming ourselves into a higher species, we can focus our best efforts on this historic and all-absorbing goal, we shall need instrumentalities already developing in such diverse fields as biology, biophysics, biofeedback, in education, psychology, and astrophysics. In this enterprise, philosophy and religion will be revivified and returned to their central places in our lives. End of the quote. Real religion, a deeper commitment to philosophic values, a new age for humankind itself. There is dawning upon this planet a spiritual renaissance which will one day make more differences in this world and the way this world is than any scientific, social, economic, governmental, or international upheaval or transition in all of human history. And the exciting thing is that you as an individual can be part of it, if you will. By daring to believe you are who and what in truth you are, a son or daughter of this living God, and a brother to every other person who walks this planet Earth. The kingdom of God is within you, and there is a plan and purpose for your life which will occupy you literally from here to eternity with the most exhilarating sense of destiny you could conceivably imagine or imaginably conceive for that matter. Recently there was a poll taken among language specialists to decide what were the most pleasant things a person could hear. They concluded that the five, quote, sweetest phrases in the English language are, I love you, dinner is served, all is forgiven, sleep until noon, and keep the change. Honorable mention went to this sentence, you've lost weight. Yet, as comprehensively delightful as it may be to hear that dinner is served or that you can keep the change, there is in fact something far more basic which every individual on this planet craves to hear, that he or she is valuable, that he or she is somehow important to the larger scheme of things, that there is a cosmic reason for being alive in this universe, and that is precisely what a man 2,000 years ago came proclaiming. That the very hairs of your head are known and numbered to God. God loves you. Be of good cheer. Fear not. Be not anxious. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. One is your Father who is in heaven. These are some of the things Jesus said, and I'll match any one of those teachings of Jesus against 
Dinner is served, keep the change, and you've lost weight. As the most refreshing and wholly delightful statements you could ever conceivably hear. And you've just heard them. The question is, will you believe them? It is totally a matter of your individual choice, whether or not you are going to claim and appropriate these spiritual truths to your life. You could be walking through a meadow utterly swirling with a million wildflowers at your feet, blossoms of every hue and fragrance, a veritable carpet of color everywhere you stepped. But it would be entirely up to you whether to pick some and take them home. Spiritual truth is likewise free in this universe. It is yours for the having, and it is yours for the living, but only you can choose to have it and live it for yourself. Only you can do God's will for you. Nobody else rhymes, as a matter of fact. Nobody else conceivably could do God's will for you. This is the supreme purpose of all of mortal existence. For many, life is mere existence. There's no ringing and resounding sensation of meaning in being alive. There was a cartoon that showed a boy watching television. His father came walking into the room, frowned at this lad, and said, What in the world would you do if they'd never invented electricity? The boy in front of the television set replied, Just sit here and watch in the dark. I suppose. That which occupies your time is the mirror image of that which occupies your mind. And if there's nothing occupying your time, there is a great likelihood there is nothing occupying your mind either. And yet, if you would dare to believe it, there is a plan for your life and a reason for your being here on this earth, and you can find it if you will choose to seek it. You can begin to be excited about life, about your life. Existence can become interesting for you in a way you might never have imagined it could because the finding and the knowing of God is the most absolutely interesting and gripping experience in all of human experience. God has a will for your life, and if you will choose to align and synchronize your mind and energies with the mind and energies of the living God who is the source and center of all that is, your life, and ultimately this world itself, will begin to change because when God and man go into partnership, great things can and do and will take place. And you can discover that for yourself beginning here and now, if you will have it so. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attaché case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.